just weeks after the end of World War II. Igor Gozenko, a Soviet cipher clerk, stationed at the Soviet Union's Ottawa Embassy during the Second World War, defected to the Canadian government with proof that his country had been spying on its wartime allies, that is Canada, Britain and the United States. This prompted what is known as the Gozenko Affair, as Gozenko sought asylum for himself and his family in Canada. In the ensuing weeks, it became a potentially dangerous international crisis, and many historians consider this as the beginning of the Cold War. Welcome to the Why in History. I am Ajay Kaul, and today we take a look at some of the biggest spy scandals during the course of the Cold War. Though some of the US officials had already been skeptical of the Soviets, the Gozinko affair triggered a spate of investigations in the United States, which uncovered quite a few spy rings that were actively passing information to the Soviets. The Soviet government admitted that certain members of its Ottawa embassy had obtained certain information of a secret character from Canadian nationals, but implied that the information was worthless. Nevertheless, the embassy staff members who were implicated in the affair were expelled by the Canadian government. The reality, though, was that despite being an ally during World War II, the Soviet Union had launched an all-out espionage effort to uncover the military and defense secrets of the United States and Britain in the 1940s. Within days of Britain's highly classified decision in 1941 to begin research on building an atomic bomb, an informant in the British Civil Service notified the Soviets. And when the top secret plan to build the bomb, called the Manhattan Project, took shape in the United States, the Soviet spy ring got wind of it before the FBI. So it was no wonder that barely four years after the United States had dropped two atomic bombs in Japan in August of 1945, the Soviet Union detonated its own in August of 1949, surprising the entire world. So who were the key recruits spying for the Soviets in providing the atomic bomb technology? In 1943, Carter Clark, who was the chief of the U.S. Army's Special Branch, which was part of the War Department's Military Intelligence Division, heard rumors of a secret German-Soviet peace negotiation. Carter Clark's Special Branch supervised the Signal Intelligence Service, which was the Army's elite group of code breakers, and it was a predecessor of the National Security Agency. And in February of 1943, when he heard these rumors, he realized that the only way to validate these was to decipher the Soviet diplomatic cables. Cables meaning the coded telegrams exchanged between the Soviet diplomats in the United States and their superiors in Moscow. So in February of 1943, Clark ordered the service to establish a small program, codenamed Project Venona, to examine ciphered Soviet diplomatic cables. The Soviet code, though, was not that easy to break. And after painstaking examination of thousands of coded uh, telegraphic cables, the Project Venona team was finally able to render the first message into readable text in 1946. Yes, in 1946, when the war was already over. They were able to confirm, though, that there was no secret negotiation going on between the Soviets and the Germans. But there was something else that they found out, which totally stunned American officials. One of the first cables rendered into coherent text was a 1944 message from KGB officers in New York showing 
that the Soviet Union had infiltrated America's most secret enterprise, the Atomic Bomb Project or Project Manhattan. From within the Manhattan Project, two physicists, Klaus Fuchs and Theodore Hall, and one technician, David Greenglass, transmitted the complex formula for extracting bomb-grade uranium from ordinary uranium, the technical plans for the production facilities, and other key documentation to the Soviets. Klaus Fuchs was the first to be arrested in Great Britain following a tip from the FBI. Uh, now, Fuchs was a German-born British scientist, and in 1943, he was part of a group of uh, British scientists brought to America to work on the Manhattan Project. On 3rd February 1950, Scotland Yard arrested him and charged him with violating the Official Secrets Act. Fuchs confessed and revealed that the person who he had passed the atomic secrets in New Mexico was Harry Gold. Harry Gold was a 39-year-old Philadelphia chemist who had been ferrying stolen information from American industries to the Soviets since 1935. And when Harry Gold was questioned, he revealed one of his sources as David Greenglass. David Greenglass was a machinist and in July of 1944, he was assigned to the Manhattan Project. He was a communist sympathizer, but to get the security clearance for the Manhattan Project, he made sure that those details were suppressed. While Greenglass was being interrogated, he provided the names of the most notorious spies associated with the Manhattan Project. His brother-in-law and sister, Julius and Ethel Rosenberg. Subsequently, Julius Rosenberg was arrested on July 17, 1950, and Ethel was arrested a few weeks later in August. Both Julius and Ethel Rosenberg had communist leanings, and by the time they met in the late 1930s, they were full-fledged members of the Communist Party. In 1940, during World War II, Julius became an engineer inspector stationed at the Army Signal Corps Engineering Laboratory in Fort Monmouth, New Jersey. In 1942, the Soviet secret police recruited Julius Rosenberg and asked him to steal research and plans for projects like uh, the new guided missile control systems that were being developed at Fort Monmouth. In 1945, Julius Rosenberg was fired when the US Army discovered his ties with the Communist Party. But by then, he had provided thousands of classified reports to the Soviet Union. So how did this spy ring of uh, Julius Rosenberg work? So when Julius Rosenberg's brother-in-law, David Greenglass, made it to the Los Alamos National Laboratory in New Mexico, he had access to most of the planning, design and experiments that took place uh, towards the uh, production of the first atomic bomb. So Greenglass would steal the information from the lab and turn it over to Julius, who in turn would hand it over to Harry Gold. Gold would then give the information to Anatoly Yatskov, who was the Soviet general counsel in New York City. So all these spies went into trial and Harry Gold was convicted to 15 years in prison. So was Greenglass. Klaus Fuchs was uh, sentenced to 14 years, but after serving nine years, he was released to East Germany. Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, though, were sentenced to death and executed on June 19, 1953. But why were the Rosenbergs the only ones executed while the rest escaped? The star witness at the trial was the brother-in-law, David Greenglass, who told the court that Julius had been a long-term spy um, and had extensively spied during the war years, and Ethel had helped him by typing up information 
that Julius had stolen. Yes, David Greenglass testified against his own sister. Now, many state that it was really Greenglass's wife who had been the typist um, for the stolen documents, but uh, it is felt that David Greenglass was trying to protect his wife and in doing so had to implicate his sister. The irony of the trial, though, was a lot of the deciphered messages from the cables could not be admitted as evidence because Americans did not want the Soviets to find out that their cables had been decoded by the Americans. There was incriminating evidence against Julius Rosenberg. But the question that has been asked through the present time is, was Ethel Rosenberg really guilty to be given the death sentence? Moving on to the 1960s, no spy story is complete without a spy swap. And for that, we look at the international diplomatic crisis that erupted in May of 1960 when the Soviet Union shot down an American U-2 spy plane in the Soviet airspace. When Dwight Eisenhower took office in 1953, there was growing alarm within the administrative circles that the Soviet Union was quickly outpacing the United States with respect to military technology. So Eisenhower approved a plan to gather information about Soviet capabilities and intentions. High altitude U-2 spy planes began making reconnaissance flights over the Soviet Union in 1956 giving the U.S. its first detailed look at Soviet military facilities. The photographs taken by the spy planes revealed that the Soviet nuclear capabilities were significantly less advanced uh, than had been claimed by their leader, Nikita Khrushchev. Eisenhower also learned that the U.S., rather than suffering a shortage of weapons or a technological gap, was far superior to the Soviet Union. But what the Americans did not know was that the Soviets were aware of these reconnaissance flights because they could spot the spy planes on the radar, but they did not have the technology to stop them. The U-2 aircraft were flying at an altitude of more than 13 miles and were unreachable by Soviet jets and missiles. But after four years, by the spring of 1960, the Soviets had developed a new Zenith surface-to-air missile with a longer range. And on May 1, 1960, that weapon locked onto a U-2 flown by 30-year-old CIA pilot Francis Gary Powers. As Powers flew over Sverdlovsk, Russia, a Soviet surface-to-air missile exploded near his plane, causing it to drop to a lower altitude, and a second missile scored a direct hit, and Powers and his aircraft plummeted from the sky. Powers managed to bail out, but when he landed, he was surrounded by Soviet forces. A diplomatic crisis had just been created. On the 5th of May, Khrushchev announced that the Soviet military had brought down an American spy plane. But he deliberately made no mention that the pilot, Gary Powers, had been captured. Now, officials in the Eisenhower administration did not realize that Gary Powers had chosen not to consume the poison that he carried when captured. So they gave a standard response that the aircraft was merely a weather plane that had accidentally flown off course. Khrushchev immediately disproved that theory by producing a photograph of the imprisoned pilot as well as evidence uh, that showed that it was indeed a surveillance aircraft. Now this incident occurred at a very crucial time in the US-Soviet relations. Eisenhower and Khrushchev were scheduled to join the leaders of France and Great Britain at a summit in Paris 
on May 14th. The goal of the summit was to yield new agreements on nuclear arms production and testing, but the U-2 incident had created a potential obstacle to that goal. Realizing the potential impact on the Paris summit, the Eisenhower administration took responsibility for the spy flights and admitted that the weather plane explanation was false. And as expected, uh, Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev walked out of the Paris meeting just hours after it had begun, saying that he could no longer cooperate with President Eisenhower. While the diplomatic squabbles were in progress, Gary Powers remained in a Soviet prison and in August 1960, he was put on trial for espionage. Gary Powers was convicted and sentenced to 10 years of confinement. Rudolf Abel, whose real name was William Fisher, was hired by the Soviet Union's intelligence service organization in 1927. He was born in Newcastle, England, to a family of Marxist revolutionaries who fled the Russian Empire but then moved to the Soviet Union in 1920. The Soviet intelligence found that he had excellent skills as a radio operator and he was also fluent in English. After World War II, Fisher was sent to the US as a deep cover agent with the code name Mark. He entered the U.S. under the guise of a Lithuanian refugee and then lived in Brooklyn as the owner of a photo studio. He organized several spy networks in California and the East Coast and he also sent a lot of intelligence information to Moscow. In 1955, Fisher's liaison person was changed to a guy with the codename of Vic who had a bad reputation and also severe alcohol problems. In May of 1957, Moscow decided to recall Wick uh, with the pretext of giving him an award, but it was actually a ruse to get him to return so that he could be dismissed. But Wick understood this and flew to Paris, went to the US Embassy and disclosed everything he knew about Fisher. Fisher got wind of this, so he decided not to escape but to destroy all the important documents he had in possession. He was arrested in a hotel room, which he was using for radio communication sessions. Fisher rejected the request to work for the US government and didn't give the Americans any information about him or his work. So he was put on trial. And by the end of his trial in 1957, Fisher escaped the death penalty only because his lawyer, James Donovan convinced the federal judge that Fisher might one day be used either as a source of intelligence information or as a hostage to be traded with the Soviets for a captured US agent. As a hostage to be traded with the Soviets for a captured US agent. James Donovan's prophecy came true five years later in 1962 when Fisher was offered in exchange for the captured US U-2 pilot Gary Powers. James Donovan actually played an important role in the negotiations too that led to the swap. The story of James Donovan and the swap has been captured in the 2015 Hollywood movie Bridge of Spies, directed by Steven Spielberg and starring Tom Hanks as James Donovan. Bridge of Spies, because both Fisher and Powers were brought to separate sides of the Glenica Bridge, which connects East and West Berlin across Lake Vansi. While the two waited, Negotiators talked in the center of the bridge, where a white line divided east from West Berlin. Finally, Powers and Fisher were waved forward and crossed the border into freedom at around 8.52 a.m. Berlin time. This was the first Cold War spy swap in history. Upon returning to the United States, 
Gary Powers was cleared by the CIA and the Senate of any personal blame for the U2 incident. Overall, this was the most embarrassing chapter in Dwight Eisenhower's presidency. And it is here that we conclude this section of the program with a promise to bring you more spy stories in subsequent episodes. On to the quiz section. Question from the previous episode. Which was the tightest race in US presidential history? The presidential race of 1824 was determined by a single vote in the House of Representatives. Unlike early elections, those running in the 1824 race were chosen based on regional popularity rather than party affiliation. And the contestants were John Quincy Adams, John C. Callahan, William H. Crawford, Henry Clay, and Andrew Jackson. Jackson won the popular vote with 152,900 to Adams's 114,023. With Clay and Crawford coming in third and fourth respectively, Kanoho withdrew from the race in the hope of becoming the vice president. Since Jackson did not receive enough votes to win the Electoral College, so under the 12th Amendment, it fell to the House of Representatives to determine the outcome. The outcome? John Quincy Adams, who hadn't won the popular vote, won by a single vote after Clay was eliminated through negotiation and his supporters in the House awarded their votes to John Quincy Adams. So the answer is C, John Quincy Adams and Andrew Jackson in 1824. Question for this episode. A single miserable rock, 230 miles off the coast of a nation, was a major point of tension between two nations during the Cold War. Who were these two nations? Were these A. Great Britain and Ireland, B. US and Cuba, C. India and Sri Lanka, or D. South Korea and Japan. Once again, a miserable rock 230 miles off the coast of a nation was a major point of tension between two countries during the Cold War. Who were these two countries? Were these A. Great Britain and Ireland, B. the US and Cuba, C. India and Sri Lanka, or D. South Korea and Japan? The answer will be provided in the next episode. That's all we have in today's episode. In the next episode, we take a more holistic look across the globe and trace the rise of China as a global economic power. The factors and the nations that contributed to its rise and what it means for the global economy going forward. Till then, stay safe and keep exploring the why in history.